Hey, welcome to the Bronx Aerosol Arts Documentary Project. My name is Butch Two, and I am joined by Ree. Welcome, Ree. Thank you. Welcome to be here. Please introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Ree, a.k.a. Opal, Pret 174, Pull 174, Unit 2. I did so many different names that I'll go more or less giving you the history on their stories. Right. All right. Tell us a little bit about your parents, family history, background. Family history, um, I came uh, to the Bronx in 1967 of November and um, came to my mom's house. My father stood back in Dominican Republic, and I was raised by my moms, my uncles and cousins and aunts, family members on my mother's side. All right, well, give, give us a little uh, breakdown about your aunts and uncles. Is it a big family? It's a very big family. As a matter of fact, my one of my oldest brothers, he wrote Ray 179. He, uh, one of his partners were um, X-Ray 174, I Mike, yeah. and Keith 150, and guys like that from my neighborhood. Okay, we... Uh, do you remember anything about the Dominican Republic? Or? Of course, I remember a lot about the Dominican Republic. Republic. That's, uh, well, being from the capital, I enjoyed myself as a child. I had a very wonderful childhood. Right. I had nothing but the best from my great-grandparents. -grand they gave me all the love and understanding until the age of five when I migrated into the States. So what were your earliest memories? What, what type of games did y'all play? What, you know, Oh, the games that we played, okay. It was one particular game that we were playing that it requires this little, this little ball that you threw it on the ground and it exploded. So it was one time that we were celebrating, I don't know what it was, but um, I had me being under the age of five and under the eye of my grandparents or my greats, they told me to be careful with it. And so they dropped to the floor and I stepped on them. And that was one experience that I never want to experience again. I just like totally passed out from the shock. <laughs> so what was the decision uh, to come to New York? Uh, you just The decision to come to New York was uh, based on my uh, grandparents making it better for us. So, you know, packed up the family, shipped them out to the States. How many of y'all was it? It was a total of um, five of us. Brothers and sisters. Brothers and sisters. Oh, Two yeah. sisters, and the rest was brothers. All right. Me, Ray, Rick, Nancy, and Yvette. All the day, everybody's in the Bronx? Everybody came straight to the Bronx. Okay. What made you come straight to the Bronx? I mean, you all well, had a family of... My family was already established in the Bronx. Right. And I have family also living in my hand, but my mom's was... On Daly Avenue. Oh, so, so that's where you landed, right on Daly? Right down Daly Avenue. Right. You still got family in the Dominican Republic? I still have uh, cousins and, yeah, lots of cousins living down there. Have you been down there lately? Uh, lately, no, but my brother took a trip two years, no, three years ago, and he says that it hasn't changed much but the highways. Mm. All right, Daly Avenue. Uh... What it, so that means that you've had uh, some of the, uh, you go, okay, Daly Avenue. Tell us about growing up on Daly. I, I know Daly. Growing up on Daly Avenue, it's, uh, I don't know if you noticed it or picture it this way. Daly Avenue runs from 180th right. on the edge of the Bronx Zoo all the way to the Cross Bronx Expressway. Which was a one, which is still a one-way street. Mm. I lived in 1891 Daly Avenue at the very edge of the Cross Bronx Expressway. 
No, no, 174th is further down. It's uh, 176. All right. right where the Tross Bronx is done. And by growing up in that, that particular building, it was to me early, early 70s, late 60s. All I have is uh, good memories of being out there playing Ring Olivia, Pony on the. Anything that was meant to be played before seven o'clock, we was out there playing it. Right. Skelzies, all Skelzies, crack top, spin the bottle, anything that was a game. So uh, let me see what I can. All right, uh, getting to uh, the Bronx in 1970. What kind of music did you listen to? Uh, the only station that I remember was WABC, and that was basically a soft rock, soft rock music. I enjoy that. All right. Uh, what what uh, what schools did you attend? Junior uh, high school, uh, public school. Public school was um, on Vice Avenue, right above uh, Daly Avenue. Is Vice Avenue. Mm -hmm. Which was uh, public school number six. PS six. PS six. I went to PS six and I stood there until uh, IS one sixty seven was uh, being built, and uh, I was supposed to go to um, public school forty four, which was up the hill on one hundred seventy six, and Marmion, I think it was. You remember the area we painted there plenty of times. Yeah, uh, 167, Lorraine Hansberry right, or something right. like that. Yeah, I went to Lorraine Hansberry. I did two years in Lorraine Hansberry. Yeah. That was the spot, that school. Everybody went there. Yeah, so what, what was the music scene like at that time? Music scene was, uh, I listened to a lot of salsa music and I listened to a lot of R&B music. That kind of thing. It wasn't something that was just driving me crazy. I just enjoy music. Right. Do you remember when you first saw graffiti? Was it on a train, a wall? Where was it, and how did it affect you at the time? I saw it on the wall first, and it affected me by opening up my eyes of what was the next movement that was taking place. After that, seeing it on the bus, and then seeing it on the train was more eye appealing than anything else. Yeah, so graph was on buses, trains, walls, everywhere. Everywhere, everywhere you went. But it wasn't, you know, it wasn't like something that you say, Pancho's doing it, Julio's doing it. You understand? Those are locals. Mm -hmm. But a person like myself that took a name that, why you took a re? You understand? You're Fred. You stay with Fred. No, I just wanted to move it. And from four letters to three letters to four letters to three letters, I just wanted to just keep my hands moving and enjoying what I was doing. And basically, that's what I did. I had so much fun. Painting from, let's say, 73 to 77, and my golden years was from 75 to 77. I had so much fun. There are so many things that take to do that one piece on the train that people say, but you went through all that circle just to spend those three hours painting that train. And I said, and I'll do it again and again and again. Because for us growing up in the Bronx, we didn't grow up with a lot of money. Our parents didn't have all that amount of money. A can of spray can was basically no more than 75 to 75 cents to a dollar fifty, depending where you went. Um Crayolas were a six pack, a 12 pack, and a 36 pack. Coloring books, my black book was a regular loose leaf notebook. It wasn't something that I went out and I got me a black book. 
that came later on down the years. So for me to get my name on that wall, I will have to go take two or three spray cans and tag it up, keep tagging it up. Then as I seen it getting wider and wider and fatter and bigger, I said to myself, I could do this. I might as well apply myself to do this. And I apply myself in that direction. It didn't come overnight, but it slowly but gradually got to that point that I said to myself, that's it. I can't go no further. And I'll explain it to you why. In 77, it got to the age that I was 17 years old already. So the laws have changed. Mm -hmm. You no longer a misdemeanor. Now it's a felon, so I don't want that on my record. And to this day, I could knock on wood, never went on my record. But I racked up enough spray paint <laughs> to continue painting through the summer, winter, all season long. That's how much paint I had to get within my possession to do what I what I did. Wow. All right, did you take any art classes in school? And if so, do you remember the classes that influenced the graph, writing at all? I did not take no uh, classes in school. All I did was just basically writing but the one that really got me into into the art class, or well, let's say into the art form, was Chino. Mm -hmm. He gave me the, you hold it this way, Fred, I know you're left-handed and everything goes in this direction, in this direction. Try to hold it in that direction so you won't have smear on your paper and stuff like that. So I give it credit to Chino for guiding me in the art world. It was an early influence. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, tell us about your early years at Graph. What did the first time you was in the yard or just anything? Ah, uh, okay. I started off on Broadway and coming from the, um, the one yard, which is very difficult yard to jump in and out. That one yard was located on Van Collin Park, and it was elevated, and the rest was flat. So for me to get to that one yard, I had to go through an obstacle course, meaning <clears throat> I had to get past certain individuals to make it up that hill, mm -hmm. to come down that hill to go across. So it's, it wasn't easy. And I still have tags inside that. Uh, Page three has my tags inside the, the one yard. And then when I learned about the, the one tunnel, that was a piece of cake. That was uh, going there for lunch, come out, Go back in there again. Spend a weekend in there if you have to. That's how wonderful and skillful that area was. Make sure you brought a plenty of paint because you're gonna spend the day there. <laughs> oh yeah. All right. Tell me a little bit more about Chino Malo. What what influence did he have? Oh, yeah. Chino Mao had that uh, leadership quality that um, brought out to all of us that whenever he did something, he took his time doing it. And <clears throat> whatever advice he had for us, even though we're both the same age, we follow suit, meaning he had the the know-how, the the material to actually do a cartoon character. And for me to do a cartoon character was like doing a stay high, stick man figure, and call it quits. <laughs> Until I started learning from Chino, 
Gina tells me, listen, uh, the eyeballs got to be here, not here, here. The head has to be a certain way. The body has to be a certain way. And at that time, we he was teaching me more with the teach with the characters. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That there wasn't a right way and a wrong way to doing them, but you wanted to keep it in perspective. Mm-hmm. One hand, if it's gonna be one hand longer than the other, it had to show. And that's what Chino was giving me, and the shading and stuff like that. He was a you know good teacher from what I see. And what I have learned. Do y'all guys ever go uh, writing together in the yard? The Chino, <laughs> me and Chino, and his brother, but his brother's younger. We used to get up in the morning and say, "Okay, Fred, we know we got to be in school today. I know you get off at twelve o'clock. I get off at three. Let's go racking, and we'll rack up all the way up to like four o'clock." But along the way, we got food. Yeah. We chit-chatted with that person. We chit-chatted with that person. It wasn't something that, no, we went out to do things, and along the way, we met bumps. And bumps, you you know, you deal with. And when it came to racking, and we took it as a joke, meaning, okay, Fred, is it okay to take it? Yeah, <laughs> we're laughing our way through it. We're not doing nobody no harm. We're just taking what we felt was ours, and we did. We were never overexcited about racking a water or nothing because it was there. But we made it a fun day, even going painting. Yo. Don't forget to pick up that red for me because I left it at the aisle over there. So when you get a chance, pick a red, pick a red. Okay. When we get to the tunnel, yo, did you get that red for me? We're painting side by side to each other, but we're communicating and having a good time. And especially in that one tunnel when we spend the whole the whole day racking Saturday morning, going in there, let's say before noon, and coming out at six or seven o'clock in the evening until the last can was done. Right. Where did you, what did you use to, to do your first tag? Remember the erasers and the zippo? What did you use? The pilot, what did, what no, did you use no, for your first okay. tag? My, to do my first tag, uh, if I remember correctly, I had uh, Jafon, uh, the Griffins. Shoe polish? Uh, shoe polish. White. White or if not black or dark maroon, yeah. those were my first ones because we're talking being at the age of 12, we didn't move that much of a distance. It was basically bodega three blocks down, that kind of nonsense. You understand? It wasn't that I'm going to Macy's or I'm going to Maze up the block or, you know, three stations away. No, it was totally local. So to keep it local, we kept the local shoe polish. Yep. That's one of the first things you could add color and all of that. Right. Okay. Because you mentioned uh, Daily Avenue and the one train. Which lines were you drawn to? And which stations did you get into for the layers? Okay. What? Okay. <laughs> Living on Daily Avenue, if you remember the bus routes, there was the 40 that ran straight up Tremont Avenue that covered from the six line all the way down to the four line. And then if you catch the 36 bus that was going up to Randall's, that was where Corvettes used to be. And then if you took it to Van Cortland Park, that was the one train, the one train. Right, so y'all took the bus to the train. (laughs) (laughs) Plenty of time to save the butt. Yeah. (laughs) So you took the train to uh, the bus to the train. All right. Uh, there was a story about a friend that you had who was struck by a train in the seventies. It was me. Mean. Me. Me. Right. Me. You were struck by the train. I was struck. I never knew that. See that scar that I have on my head? I see it. That scar was, uh, I think, 
I could be wrong, 75, 76. I was, um, it was uh, me, POW, Ted, um, Liz, uh, Z28, Paul. Which, yeah, no, the thing was, we all worked together. Uh, Bluebeard, uh, Moose 106, Waz, Chick, Chiu. We all worked for the Youth Corp, and Love yeah, so we never took care of kids. The kids took care of us. All we did was just <laughs> give them lunch. <laughs> so that particular that particular day, we were supposed to meet up by my house and catch the train going into the city, so we could all meet up. The rest the kids and everything else to go out to Bear Mountain. So I got on, on Tremont Avenue, and before I hit 174, I had the scar across my head. What happened was, <clears throat> um, Tremont, 174, and like I said, we lived right next to the highway. So Teddy and Ted and uh, POW, two brothers, were talking and looking out the window. Yo, this is the, there goes PS6. So Traffic light. Right, right, right. And I stuck my head out, and before I knew it, that signal pole just slapped me right across back inside the inside the car. So what happened? Were you out? Did they have to get you? Oh, well. <laughs> I wasn't out. I didn't get knocked out. All I got, I took my shrimp trunks and I covered my head. Once I covered my head, I took it off and I just saw a big C and I said, oh, shit. So from there on, uh, I told the rest of the guys, continue going to your destination. Only me, Ted, and POW, got, or Sam, got off and they walked me back to my house. I didn't lose conscience. I never lost memory. So <clears throat> on my way home, Teddy said, yo, mom is going to kick your ass. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You're in trouble. Yep. I said, yeah, I know. How the hell am I going to pull this one off? So when I walked into my uh, apartment, my sister was there. She tells me, Fred, what happened? I went like that. And she ran my head under the under the water, and all you see was globs, my hair falling out. Now, mind you, my hair was down to my shoulders. And she says, oh, shit, I wonder what mom is going to say now. So, God and behold, she walks in through that door. As soon as she sees me, man, and all I got was just a slap across the head. And... She screamed and hollered for for a couple of minutes, and then uh, one of her um, best friends decided to uh, take me to the hospital, the one in um, the Concourse, Le Lebanon. Yeah, whatever, 173rd, I think it's Lebanon. Lebanon. So they took me there, and they started stitching me up, and the doctor came out and says, uh, I'm sorry, but I, I can't <laughs> stop the bleeding. I, I had like over 40 stitches in and out from from that point to that point. Mm -hmm. uh, throughout the years, it shrunk, but I had that. That was the, you know. That was that uh, incident. Incident. How old were you? I was still in junior high school. That's 14. Yeah. Wow. How did that change your... Your attitude about the trains, you still went to the yards? And... It didn't slow me down. The only time that it slowed me down was when I was being medicated, meaning I had to stay home. I had to go to school, so and I had to wear a hat all the time because I had a big bald spot, not like now, but <laughs> worse. I had you know, long hair and then a big bald spot, so I had to keep it covered until it started growing in and then that's when my mother played that little secret on me and go get a go get a trim and the trim turned out to be 
a crew cut. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, sorry to hear that. I didn't know nothing about that. Yeah, yeah, that was me. T tell me about uh, some of your crews, man. Uh, mass transit artists. Yes. And stuff like that. They go way back. Tell me about some of the crews you're affiliated with. Well, me and Chino came out. Came out with uh, Master Tigers Association, and it was just local until it got to the point that I told Chino, "Yo, we got to take it up. We got to spit, take it to the next level." We've been going to Broadway, we've been tagging it up, but let's make statements. And Chino says, well, you know, we could do it. It's just that we don't have enough guys. I said, just you and I doing it. We don't need no more. Everybody else will fall in suit. And that's exactly what took place. You know, he listened to me for that point, and, and he was very happy with it. Mm. So who, who was the pres and who was the vice pres? Chino was the pres. I was the vice pres MTA, right. of MTA. Okay, any other crews or vandals and all them guys? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I um, At that point, when I started moving on up, like they say, I ran into different crews, crew members, and they gave me their blessings of uh, taking place with their crews. I had, uh, I met a lot of guys along the way. That's it's yourself. Yeah. All right, well, you know what? Walk us through your process of doing a piece. I, I mean, I want to be a writer. I, I don't know. <laughs> a process of doing a piece. You want it on in the yard, in the layup, in the tunnel, because there's different heights. People don't seem to realize that the wheels play the big factor in the game. If if I'm in the one, if I'm in the one yard, the wheels were up to my chin. So I had to either step on the third rail to get a good, good height from right. window down mm -hmm. to make it work. If I'm in the, um, the two layer, I work the two layer, and you have worked the two layer also. I have worked from station to station. I found it <laughs> the bad way that um, painting in between stations, you constantly have to be alert. Mm -hmm. Meaning the uptown train is going to be coming every half hour. So from the corner of your eye, you got to constantly keep an eye out for that light. It's not like painting on the station because once that train pulls up into that particular station, I'm here. I have to find a safe place to be, meaning under the car or in between cars just to let that train go by so I could continue painting. It was a process. Now painting on the station was cutting the process down in half. Meaning, I don't have to hide under the car no more. I could come back and stand on the platform and be on the platform. And then on top of that, when at the middle of the station, there's two bars on each side, on the uptown side and the downtown side. Stand on top of that bar, which you pulled off a lot of top to bottoms from there. I said to myself, this is great. I don't have to be short no more. Um, same height or maybe a little smaller, depending on the height that we are. And I felt that more exciting because, yes, you are paying attention, but you're also paying attention to the people that are on the platform. And are they going to rat you out? Are they going to cheer you on? Or whichever way it went. So I was back and forth just to pull that one off. What about the, the paint? You had... Oh, man, carrying paint yeah. was a mission. 
Um, going to Utica one time with Mr. Ruff. Way out in the book. Yeah, yeah. I see. I see. <laughs> Utica is in Brooklyn, all of deep down deep in Crown Heights, I think it is. And it's a mission. But we took that route. It was basically me and Mr. Ruff with uh, four shopping bags of paint. Now, we're not talking plastic bags. We're talking big brown bags. And the paint either was standing up all in a row or laying flat one on top of each other. The reason why, because if you just throw them, the marble is just going to go anywhere it wants to go. So we kept it in one position at all times. The cops were always on the trains. Detectives were always on the trains. And they always looked at us as suspicious characters and so on and so on. So we try to keep it as safe as possible. So going out to Utica, Kingston's, and all those layers out there in Brooklyn, we had to be like a, a mouse, quiet, sitting in the corner, yeah. and let the stations just go by. Go fast, go fast. And once we got to those stations, it was another mission just to get to that location. Um, last year, they came out a report of uh, two French kids got hit by a train. That was Utica Station in Brooklyn. In Brooklyn. It has three tubes, tunnels coming out into the open. For me to go inside that tunnel, either I get off on Utica and work my way down the tracks or get up on Sutter and come out into the street. By doing that, that exposes me to those three entrances. Now, I got up on Sutter, backtrack into this little park. In that little park, they had a six, a six foot fence and a tennis court. Make sure that nobody was playing tennis. Go there and climb over that fence and cross those tunnels. Me and Chino one time, and he's, he's happy to this moment because we experienced something that he has never experienced. Like I said, me and him used to be clowns left and right. Me and Pierre Duck. Clowns. We used to just joke around and take everything with a grain of salt. And I went into the tunnel, and Chino was coming behind me, and he started, you know, with his sarcastic laugh, like, ha, 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 we're mm -hmm. here, man, we're here, man. Mm -hmm. That train was coming in to, it was going, it was going uptown and we were on the uptown tube. And if I didn't lean him against the wall, that train would have just dragged him across. He saved his life. Yeah, well, it's not a saved life, you understand? It's a, it's a love situation. It's how you felt about the person. It's not, if you hated him, you would let him get hurt. It was, you know, it's that kind of thing, you understand? We came together, we leave together. So Chino, like I said, we laughed it off and we went straight in there and we just started bombing. And then you you say, um, yo, Mr. Ruff, why are you on that side, not on this side? He says, it's cleaner size on this side. But that exposed size, the conductor sees. Mm, right. And you know, you tell him, yo. Come on over to the other side. And no, I want to do this side. And before you know it, the, um, the motorman yelled out to the tower on top of because it was a station up there in Utica. Right. And ba -da 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 -da, they all start running down and scramble like roaches and find a way out. You left your paint behind? I never leave my paint behind. Don't do that. <laughs> I always kept my paint inside the car, under the seats. Or if not, inside where the conductor used to be at. 
The conductor was always in the middle. If there was eight cars, he was on number four. Right. So, so if he was in the middle, the other two cars, you could have done whatever you want inside those uh, conductor's booth. Nobody would have picked it up, especially when it's tied up and just thrown to the corner. So uh, did you tell us about how you set up for your production? Did you do it, did outlines in a black book or? Did you just wing it, or what did you, how did you prepare for Ch your pieces? Chino was one with paper. I was the type of person that I looked at my paint, and I'll set up my colors according to what I was going to do. Right. And basically, I did a lot of straight letters, meaning Western-style letters, bubble-style letters, that kind of thing. So it wasn't something for me to do it on paper which I did do it on paper sometimes, but I never called for that. I winged it a lot. Did anybody ever help you? Uh, Chino always yeah. helped me. Yeah. Filling in, no, we, we had, I mean, <laughs> Niagara spray caps, they right. used to spray that big, man. So filling in was a joy because all you hear was simple. <laughs> That's all you heard. And the smell of it coming out that ultimate high. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, same now. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah. Gino, Gino was one that was, uh, when it came to doing like the Chino Malo and Reed whole car with the Cheech Wizard in the corner, he was a little taller than me. So he had, uh, we did that in 225th. He had the, the lower part and I had the higher part. And he did a lot of the filling, especially when he did his whole name. Instead of C. Malo, he did Chino Malo, the whole name. I don't know how many freaking nine letters. Um, yeah, I have to interrupt for a sec. No, not to interrupt, but I had your shirt, and I think that was what was on that shirt, the Chino Malo with the Cheech and yeah, the Yeah, yeah. The, we, I had that. He gave me that as a gift. Yes. We did that, I think, in, um, I think was 75, and that was the first Bow Day characters on the train. Because mm -hmm. Chino, Chino was a, a Bow Day. Bon Bo and all of that. Yeah, oh, he loved those type of characters. And when he met, met uh, Vaughn, he was head over heels, man. <laughs> what was his son, Mark Bow? Mark Bow Day, yes. Right. Uh, tell us about... Uh, the fat cap situation, because back then it's different. See, you, people, you couldn't just order 100 banana caps. No, no. see, be, people don't seem to realize that we had a rough, but we enjoyed it. Yeah. I mean, if I went to Rack of Paint and I saw a supermarket in that corner, I said, I'll be right back. You know what you got to do? I got to go inside that supermarket yeah. and check in the household section for Niagara Space Starch and Jafom uh, Oven Cleaners. That's right. And I'm like this. That's right. <laughs> uh, like a squirrel with a whole bunch of caps inside my mouth. <laughs> and that's how I used to get my caps. It wasn't that, you know, oh, we'll make it as it go. The can came with one stock cap. We improvised or provided right. with the fat cap. Yeah. How to make it fatter and fatter. You take a, a needle, yeah. heat it up a little, and you right in the same hole, go a little deeper, and it got fatter and fatter. Yeah. I had a couple of um, categories. Taking photos and black books. Did you ever get into the photos, the little yellow Instamatics? I got into the photos late in the game. But I wasn't good at it because uh, I'm not a photographer. I wasn't skilled to be a photographer. It was just, you know, yo, they go, right. whatever came out, came out because right. it wasn't digitalized like it is today. Um, again, that was another rocking day. Mm -hmm. I went to Alfred E. Smith High School. Colvetch was on 3rd Avenue. So I used to go there to get my film. And on that film, 35, 110, 126, right. Right. 
in the back came an envelope to mail it out. To mail it out. So that was just another tool of the trade to yeah. go as you went through the right. racking business. All right. Black books. Well, tell me about black books. When did you first save them, give them to someone to hit? When did that hit you? Black book. Black yeah. books, um, okay, with me, I wasn't a black book person because I what I experienced what took place out at the bench. At the bench, you, yo, can you do my black Somebody book? Somebody took your book. Well, to me, it didn't matter because I wasn't a black book person. But I have seen guys, yo, take my book two months later and the book is not, yo, what happened to my black book? Yo, that was yours, man. I passed it on to Mo and Mo passed it on to Curly. And when you come to see, you're not getting it back. Yeah. So that wasn't my gig. That has happened. Yeah, plenty of times. Plenty of I, I've times. seen, uh, to this day, I've seen uh, Too Swift was one to keep a black book. Chino was another one because he needed it for school details. But as the ages go by, Too Swift black book got destroyed. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Too Swift was my boy for a minute. Uh... So there was there only one designated guy to get the caps for the for the crew for MTA or no 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 it's, uh, it's it's whoever could get the most you understand it wasn't something that we we always share there right. wasn't something that uh, yeah yo I need a cap here you go yeah. uh, it's coming out of my mouth but you're getting a cap mm -hmm. that kind of thing yo before we go inside the tunnel can you get me uh, two Japones and one and one uh, Niagara's because I got the Rustos and stuff like that. No problem. Here that's you right. go. That's how it goes. Is there any particular colors or brands of spray paint or markers that you prefer? Well, when it came to spray paint, to me, Red Devil was the ultimate paint for me. The reason why I felt I made mistakes, plenty of mistakes, but the Red Devil always seems to cover my mistakes. There were some yellow, some oranges, and some pineapple-looking colors from wet look and stuff like that. That You put it on, and if it doesn't have a good outline on it, that's going to look like garbage. Yeah. So I trusted a lot the Red Devil can to give me a good outline. Right. Um, but I also love um, rust -Oleum. Rustolium to me, the Marlin Blue, the Cascade Greens, the fe all federal safety colors were to me the ultimate cry weapon. Meaning every time you go rack them, they're not there no more. Yeah, it, it, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was uh, what's that word? Search and destroy. <laughs> Very distinct. It's hard to find. Yeah, they were all rare. You, you say, "Oh, look, morning blue. They got two cans left." Federal <laughs> safety purple. Give it to me. All right. Well, tell us what you're working on now. What are you? What have you been up to lately? Uh, lately, uh, I have been working on canvases and also, you know, keeping myself occupied and painting, you know, within our legal walls and stuff like that. You got any paint partners uh, today? Paint partners, I have a few that, you know, keep me up and going. Clyde, which I have painted, Clyde back, and Frankie, FDT56. Right. They still with me, and we're still doing our things. Right. Um, Roger. Roger's still, you know, doing his thing. Right, the usual cats. Yeah, so. my usual mm -hmm. suspects. I cannot let, I, I can't shake them off, but it's good to have them. Old time is days coming yeah. up. Uh, yeah. What, what was I going to ask you? Uh, what about uh, any galleries? Y'all been had any shows lately? Been in any galleries? Or? I stopped doing gallery shows for a hot minute, and I was invited to a gallery shows on the 18th in Brooklyn. So I'll be doing one show this year. A, a solo solo show? Or? No, no, it's a group show. It's me, Charmin, 
you know, another yeah, me, Charmin, um, Bart, Ben, Renard Kelly. Renard Kelly, yes. I think you told me about that. Uh, to talk about uh, any rivalries that you had with any crews. You ever had any beef with anybody? Rivalries, it was only a competition thing. It wasn't yeah, something, you know, yeah. it wasn't something of crossing each other out. No, it's, let's say I'm going to be on the two and five line. Let's see who sees each other's tags the most. Okay. You got two days. <laughs> I got two days. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. That was the only rivalry we had. It wasn't something like, uh, I get up more than you, you get up more than me. No, we're here to compete. Let's do it a friendly competition. All right. Um, well, what do you do today? Uh, are you um, working? Are you retired? What, what, what are you doing today? Uh, today, I'm medically retired, and um, I stay home half of the time, and I work on my canvases, and... I continue keeping these hands moving. Yeah, the art is a, is a blessing. Okay, look, here we go. What does graffiti mean to you? Uh, what has your understanding of graffiti changed at all over time? The word graffiti <clears throat> has been given to us by others. We have always called each other a writer. What you write, what you write, what you write. I uh, wasn't, never came up to, yo, I'm going to go do graffiti. Go ahead. No, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go tagging up. I'm going to go writing. That was it. I only learned of the word graffiti, let's say late 70s, when I started hanging out with more adult people. And they, oh, you do graffiti? Okay, that's what you call it. That was it. Because being part of Noga, I had to deal with a lot of people in the West Side. And there were, you know, graffiti artists. And I love to buy your work and that kind of little nonsense. And you say to yourself, you label it your way, I'm doing it my way. So I'm a writer. Yeah, that, that graffiti versus aerosol. Okay, well, how about uh, as far as then and now? How, how is your... Business? Then and now, my mentality has changed a lot. I was a child doing something that requires a lot of uh, brain cells. And now that I have the brain cells, I say to myself, I enjoyed everything that I did. Mm -hmm. It's a learning process. Yes. Yeah, uh, on a more mature level, it's it's a market now. It's, it's a little different. Right now, it's a lot different. I have traveled. I have traveled, uh, let's say, from point A to point B on this particular game. And you have to be up to par to compete with the next generation artists. Right. Guys like us, we could say... We just want to live back. No, I want to be competitive. I want to make sure that I could compete against you. Not to be proud of. It's just something that I have always thrived in me. I love my friends. But if you're going to stop, I'm going to continue until I get tired. And that happened to me with three partners. They decided, yeah, let's sit back and let's watch the grass grow. I got a girlfriend now. <laughs> you say, okay, <laughs> more for me. <laughs> That's right. More paint, more space. <laughs> so you, you left three partners behind. Yeah. Who were they? I left Chino, his brother, Ruff, Mr. Ruff. Mm -hmm. And then after that, when I left the TMG crew to carry on, Team True, TMT, KT, KT, Chain. Chain. Yeah. But, but MTA still lives. So you kind of. It lives, but it lives differently. Okay, let, let's, let's put that into perspective. 
three YB, BYB. BYB came off three YB. Mm -hmm. Eventually, three YB faded out and BYB continued. That's the same way I felt about MTA and TMT. MTA faded out, TMT continue on and rise up. So yes, it's still the same, but the next person that's gonna hear it, it won't hear the MTA, they will hear the TMT, which is perfect. So are you still a member of TMT? Yes. Tell me more about TMT. Uh, these guys, are they active today? Are they painting? Are they doing, you know? Right now, they're active in their own little ways, meaning at home doing sketches, because Cade and Team, two brothers, they stay home and they sketch, they do. Cade is more the artistic one in the family. I'm not saying Team is not, but he's the one that puts the characters together and so on and so on. And Team does the letter works. And they, you know, two brothers, they work very well, just like. Uh, Stem and T, uh, Solid, and, and Bot. You understand those? They were brothers, and what I mean is they have more time to spend with each other and bounce off each other right. than two partners. Meaning, me and my partner by seven o'clock we were at different households looking at the ceiling, mm -hmm. while two brothers could be in the same room sketching out their next agenda. Right. That's what I give them credit. Um. Yeah. Where Where do you see yourself in the art world for the future? Are you still continuing to drive, build? Are you going to do shows? Are you going to? I'm going to continue doing what I do best. If uh, you know, if it takes me to the age of sixty-seven and I can't do no more, and I'm hoping that I could. No. Nope. Yeah. I'm going to continue thriving out there. Even if it's uh, doing it through spray paint or doing it through a uh, brush, I'm going to continue. So you, were you hoping to sell that million dollar canvas like no, crash and those guys? No, no. See, I, I'm not that type of, I'm not s stating that these guys, what they do is what they do. I'm going to do a canvas whenever I feel comfortable. And if it moves for X amount of dollars, it moves for sure, X yeah. amount of dollars. I'm not looking to hurt nobody in any kind of way. It's just whatever you give me for it, I'll accept it. Mm -hmm. But there's always yeah, a price. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that's a good question. Has, has your talent, your creativity, in your opinion, Passed on to the next generation. Does your your children have talent? Or? Yes, my children are uh, very talented artists. One, two, three. They all could secretly. They all could paint. Meaning they could sit there and sketch and give you the eyes in their proper locations, their lips, the right dimensions, and everything else. Wow. Yeah. Have you taught them, or is it just in, in an eight quality, or it's, a little bit of both? It's a little bit of both. I say learn from experience, meaning sit down and Keep look what that, yeah. Keep drawing. That's what they do. That's nice. Uh, any any uh, any projects? You got any canvases or something? Uh, I wish. I would love to do a show with my kids, but that's up to them. That's in, not in up to me. Time. Yes. That's good. I don't take them in. Beat them over the head, Take you know. Paint, paint, paint. No, no. Being left-handed, I'm bad enough. Being a left-handed left person, I was beaten upon as a child to switch over to my right hand. Never happened. And then never. I, well, I could write with both hands, but I prefer my left. That's what they told me to raise, and I kept it going. But they have took in my left hand and hold it down and. Go with this wow. hand and go with this hand and go with that hand. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, all right. We're going to close this out um, with one question. What is the Bronx? The mean Bronx to is you? home. All right. I've, the Bronx has been in my life ever since it came into my life, and it will never leave. I mean, I live in Jersey, yes, but. 
my heart still stays in the Bronx. That's that's a, a lot of guys are going to church. How, if you don't mind, mm -hmm. how did you have the privilege or luck to get to Jersey? The privilege and luck that I had, how I found my way to Jersey was 9-11. When 9-11, when those two planes hit the towers, I was living in Flatbush, Brooklyn. Oh, yeah. Um, after seeing what I saw with my own eyes and I couldn't move from where I was to that place, meaning I was working on 14th Street, but I couldn't get to work because all the trains were being shut down and everything oh, else. So once my wife's uh, brother explained to me, listen, you could live in Jersey, but it doesn't have to be deep into Jersey. Yeah, right on the other side of the bridge. Right, right across the bridge. Beautiful. Yeah. And that's where I've been ever since. Left Brooklyn, huh? Yeah. All right. Okay, yeah. Uh, uh, so the Bronx is just home. The Bronx is home? It's home. Okay, so what does, it, what does the Bronx mean to you? The Bronx means so much to me. I have learned so much. I grew up here. I went to school here. It means a lot to me. Friends, family. Uh... Everything is beyond words. That's how, how I feel about the Bronx. If I go anywhere, where are you from, the Bronx? Yeah. What else can you say? All right. Uh... Yeah, we're gonna ask you for your tag. Uh, do we have the paper, or do we gonna do? Yeah, let us get your tag live for the Bronx Historical Society aerosol and, and for our archives. This is Reed. And you had a, a good business venture going for a minute. You had the shirts and stuff all out. You had the store. Wasn't that in Jersey? That was also in Jersey. Yeah. Did y'all have a paint wall or were you selling spray paint too? We were selling spray paint. We had our own walls. And due to the pandemic, everything went down the tubes. Oh. All right. Classic tag. There you go. Good enough. Thank you. Appreciate it, Mr. You're Reed. Welcome.